The Unified Chemistry exam papers on the OCRA specification are very challenging and very overlooked as a part of every good student's revision schedule. You must use these papers if you want real success in the summer exams as they contain excellent examples of the content from all the modules that get assessed. In this video, I'm going to walk you through the explanations and answers to the 2021 OCRA Unified Chemistry exam paper and I'll signpost you to supportive resources all along the way. As always, check out the video description for any updates to this tutorial, the video chapters, and links to more content. Alright then, kicking off with question one, and we've got this little intro at the start that tells us these short questions are from different areas of chemistry, and we've seen other unified chemistry exam papers start off this way. Part A is all about finding the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. So just because this is a unified chemistry exam paper doesn't mean that the calculation has changed. In order to find the partial pressure of a gas, we still need to do mole fraction of that particular gas component multiplied by the total pressure. We've got a total pressure from the question, that's the 50, but obviously what we haven't got is the mole fraction of the CO2. We do know that the gas mixture is just CO2 and O2, and we've got masses for those though. So using mass divided by molar mass, I can find out those individual mole values for the CO2 and the O2, add those together to get a total number of moles of 6.25, and then the mole fraction of CO2 can be found by doing 2.5 divided by the 6.25, giving me a mole fraction of 0.4. Don't forget that the sum of all your mole fractions should equal one, just like the sum of all your partial pressures should equal the total pressure of the system. Here, what I need to do then is take that 0.4, multiply it by the total pressure, and that gives me a partial pressure of the CO2 equal to 20.0. Moving on to part B, and initially this question seems really, really difficult because you're being asked for two different concentrations from one KC expression. And I think that's going to make people think there's some sort of horrific ratio thing going on in this question. But actually, it's not too bad. If you look at the reaction equation, it really makes me think of the dissociation of a weak acid. I can completely see how PCL5 has got nothing to do with a weak acid. But take a look at it. Imagine if this was HA, and this was H+, plus and this was A-. minus. Can you see there what I mean? And these two products are the ones that we're being asked to determine the concentrations of. Right then. When we think about the approximations of a weak acid when it comes to its calculations, we actually assume that these two values, if they were H plus and A minus, would be the same as each other. And that's exactly what I'm going to do here. I'm going to presume that if I can find one of these concentrations, that's going to be equal to the other one. So, just like with Ka, when I write out the expression, the numerator here is going to get simplified to one of the quantities squared. Then I can rearrange the expression for Kc as a subject of that concentration, and you can see that I've got that going on just here, and then I've got my square root going on for that. So I get a PCL3 value as two times 10 to the power of negative two. Then what I'm gonna do is quote this as the same value for the Cl2. So it's very, very similar to the Ka stuff when you're looking at the pH of a weak acid. Next up for part C, we've got some electronegativity values. These are actually Pauling scale values. And we've also got the boiling points of methane, ammonia, and hydrogen fluoride. What we need to do is explain the difference in the boiling points. But of course, we've been given the electronegativity data, so we've got to do something with it. You're not given data in chemistry exams or you're expected to do nothing with. Everything is useful. So... Remember that a lot of the boiling point information for simple molecular lattice structures is rooted way back in the idea of there being dipoles because of differences in electronegativities and then the intermolecular forces that come from the interactions between dipoles. So here my first point is saying that the boiling point trend is an increase with increasing electronegativity of the central atom. That gets me a mark. Then, using my knowledge from A-level chemistry of intermolecular forces, I'm going to point out how ammonia and HF have actually got hydrogen bonding as their strongest type of intermolecular force, 
whereas CH4 has only got London forces. And again, that is rooted in the fact that there is a big difference between the electronegativities of nitrogen and hydrogen, and hydrogen and fluorine respectively, and that causes for those different intermolecular forces. I then make a comment about hydrogen bonds being stronger than London forces, or, and I don't think he would have done this, but I've included it in my written answer, you might have talked about how even though ammonia and hydrogen fluoride have both got hydrogen bonds, the hydrogen fluoride has got stronger hydrogen bonds. I mean, you might have actually put that on top of talking about how hydrogen bonds are stronger than London forces. I don't know. You'll also notice I've got this little extra comment at the bottom down here marked by the asterisk. In previous mark schemes, not only are you meant to talk about, for example, how hydrogen bonds are stronger than London forces, but there's often another mark in there for talking about how, therefore, more energy is required to break hydrogen bonds compared to London forces. And so I personally would have included this little asterisk point down here based on my experience with other mark schemes. Moving on to part D, and I think there's a bit of a qualitative analysis, module three, looking at the group two chemistry here. There's a bit of crossover with that. We've also got a little bit of moles work with regards to empirical formula. Let's take a look at the question. Compound A has the following percentage composition by mass. So we know, just like I said then, we're looking at uh, an empirical formula calculation. And a student reacts compound A with plain old water. That's a theme in this paper a little bit to form an alkaline gas, B, and alkali, C. Now, the alkaline gas, straight away with the fact that there is nitrogen and water here, so I'm thinking nitrogen and hydrogen, the alkaline gas is likely to be ammonia. And that's because there is a link there to the qualitative analysis topic where an alkaline gas can be released in the testing for ammonium ions. So that's your cation test in module three. We're being told by the question to identify A, B, and C and write the equation for the formation of the reaction of compound A with water. Okay. First off then, empirical formula straight away. If I did the calculation, I'd get Ca3N2, and that's compound A. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that the alkaline gas is going to be ammonia, based on my knowledge of the module 3 topic qualitative analysis. And then also, based on my knowledge of the module 3 topic group 2 chemistry, the alkali C, considering that I've been told that calcium is involved, I'm going to suggest calcium hydroxide. I know that there is a reaction. I'm not saying, of course, that it's a, exactly the same one that I've got here, because this isn't on your specification at all. We definitely don't look at calcium nitride reacting with water. But we do talk about calcium metal reacting with water to make calcium hydroxide and hydrogen gas. So I don't think it's a massive reach here to expect someone to determine that calcium hydroxide could be the alkali C that's being produced here. Then constructing this reaction equation at the end is the final mark. If you do struggle putting together these unfamiliar reaction equations, don't spend too long on this because you're going to miss out on the rest of the paper. But I do think here that this question, whilst a little bit abstract, is a good test of general chemistry and a lot of that module three material. Part E here is where things get a little bit trickier. What we've got here is a molecule of lactic acid and we're using it throughout this question. And what we need to show is how the lactic acid molecule is reacting with sodium carbonate and aluminium. Now, there are two functional groups on lactic acid, where I do think this question makes you second guess yourself a lot. One of them is a secondary alcohol group, which you'll see I've already circled up as saying not being used. And the other is a carboxylic acid group. Now, the secondary alcohol group isn't actually reacting in this question, but it takes a lot of confidence to know that for certain. And I think this is a real demand on your subject knowledge to know that in both these reaction equations, you shouldn't react that secondary alcohol group. You are only reacting the carboxylic acid group each time. And it takes just as much knowledge in your A-level chemistry to know that the carboxylic acid group is reacting here as it does to make sure that you don't react that secondary alcohol group. So here I've got the reaction with sodium carbonate and aluminium. The big demand here is making sure that you can draw these carboxylate salt formula accurately. You could have drawn them out. You could have used a skeletal formula here, but structural formula is what I went with based on what was already given to me by the question over here on the left. And what I'm able to do by doing so, just by mirroring this type of formula, this structural formula here, I'm able to mirror that inside the, the formula here for the carboxylate salt, and I'm less likely to make a mistake. 
Some people struggle with writing this one here, which is for the aluminium ion containing salt, uh, carboxylate salt structure, and people don't like writing this bit here in the brackets. But ask yourself, if it was nitric acid instead of this lactic acid that was being used, would you find it so different to write AlNO33 like so? I don't think you would. And so don't get thrown off by how this is written out just here. It's exactly the same kind of thing. And you can put the aluminium at the front or at the back. It doesn't matter. Don't overthink that side of it. Just make sure you don't show any charges inside the brackets here, just like you wouldn't show charges inside the brackets of the aluminium nitrate. Part F is quite a tricky question. And I think it's a tricky question because you're told the names of lots of structures, but not actually shown them. So this is the first hack to this uh, style of question. Make sure if they name an organic molecule that they haven't given you the structure of in the question, your first thing is to draw it. Because by visualizing the molecule, that makes you more enabled to actually be able to answer the question. And so in this very challenging question, do yourself a favor, draw out the structures that it mentions. So here I've got the methyl ethanoate and I've got this carboxylate ion just here, which I'm told I can react to haloalkane with to get to the ester, the methyl ethanoate. So we need this utmost confidence here to know that the haloalkane is going to be something like chloromethane just here. And we also need the confidence to know that this is the structure of the carboxylate ion. So how do I know that? Well, if you look at this highlighted yellow section of the ester compared to the carboxylate, we can see where the carboxylate group is coming from. It's got that C double bond O and O feature on the same carbon, and the oxygen has got a negative charge. Now, because that's got a negative charge, my attention is drawn to that as well as being the nucleophile. We can also see here that the Haloalkane is just going to be chloromethane, and that's because the rest of the ester is just a little CH3 group. It's that methyl ethanoate, isn't it? So I'm going to suggest chloromethane. My curly arrow mechanism here is nucleophilic substitution, which is mentioned in both modules 4 and 6. And here we can see we've got curly arrow going up to the delta positive carbon and off and onto the chlorine. I also am going to suggest here that the haloalkane is getting attacked by a nucleophile, because in both of the mechanisms for, well, both of the examples, I should say, of nucleophilic substitution in your specification, as in module four and in module six, the haloalkane is the component getting attacked by the nucleophile. So let's not make it the nucleophile today. Let's just let it get attacked by one. Don't forget to show both products over here in any curly arrow mechanism. Consider all the products that should get made and make sure you show them nice and clearly side by side with the bond connectivity really correctly done. Question two starts off with a lot of information and it's very heavy on the moles. The content is framed around the idea that we don't know the ionic charge on the europium ion being produced in the reaction equation between europium metal and a dilute acid. This then influences the balancing when the acid reacts with the europium metal to produce hydrogen. I think this is a really good question, but it's going to throw you off completely because you've got a lot of reading to do in this. But the gist is we don't know which of these europium ions is the correct one. And depending on which one it is, we've got these different ratios between the europium and the hydrogen all the way through. So it's a little bit chaotic to start off with, and there's a lot of reading to get through. When we get to part A, we need to draw a gas collection. If you don't choose to draw a gas syringe like I've done here, then you instead need to draw an inverted measuring cylinder in a basin of water. Key thing to point out here, though, is no matter what you do, you've got to do labels. If you don't give it labels, it's just a picture and there are no marks or pictures in A-level chemistry exams. You've got to make sure you've got the labels that I have here. Always go all out with the labels. If you've got a piece of kit on there, it gets a label. No gaps, please, as well in your pathway. So, for example, if I make some hydrogen gas in here, make sure that I've got a nice closed off system all the way through here to be collecting in the gas syringe. I do think a gas syringe is a quicker one to draw. You don't need to show a clamp stand gripping this or anything like that. We just need to make sure we've got this levitating gas syringe just here and we've got this nice closed system with no horizontal lines cutting us off. Let's see how I've drawn the bone just here in the top of the conical flask. This is exactly how you should get this drawn in an exam.
Next up in part B, we are told to use the experimental results to conclude which equation is the correct one from the reaction. So using the results, what we've got to do is find out the mole value of both the hydrogen gas produced and the europium that we used. Now, when you look at the ratio of the mole values just here, we can see that this is one to one. It's imperfect, but it's one to one. And I don't want to say this is something you're always going to see in the unified chemistry papers, but I have noticed that they do sometimes use a bit more real chemistry data where everything isn't completely perfect. And so the fact that these aren't absolutely identical is totally okay. Now, since this ratio is one to one, if we go back to our set of equations, we can see that equation number two has that one-to-one -one ratio between the hydrogen and the europium. So we make a conclusion here that equation two is the correct answer. In part C, the student repeats the experiment but adds concentrated hydrochloric acid instead of dilute hydrochloric acid. The apparatus gets hot during the reaction. Predict how the hot apparatus would change the student's results and the conclusion in part B, explain your answer. The first mark here is pretty expected. Gases expand as they get hotter. The second mark is for linking this to a larger volume of hydrogen, therefore being recorded. Not actually achieved, just recorded because you're not going to get more hydrogen, it's just going to expand because of the heat. This results in a larger number of moles assumed to be collected for the hydrogen and this affects the ratio we were discussing in the previous answer. Part D for question one is a very tough end to the question. The student modifies their method as outlined below. They have 1.52 grams of europium and it reacts with an excess of dilute hydrochloric acid. So far, so good. An excess of aqueous sodium hydroxide is then added to the reaction mixture. A precipitate forms, which is collected, dried, and weighed. We need to explain how the mass of precipitate forms, so that would be a mass in grams recorded in the lab, would allow the student to conclude which of equation one, two, or three is correct. So just when you think you've proved which equation is the correct answer, the question throws you this curveball about hydroxide precipitates. This is a really challenging end to the question. Let's have a look back at what's happening. Some sodium hydroxide is being added to the products and the only thing that can be reacting with this sodium hydroxide is the europium ion. But remember, we don't know for certain just yet which europium ion is the correct one from the three different equations suggested at the start of the question. The question then suggests that the europium hydroxide is an insoluble precipitate and that's a link to the transition elements topic alongside the qualitative analysis topics in modules 3 and 5. The different potential precipitates here, as you can see identified in the red just there, would have different molar mass values. So we can use these alongside the mole value up here, because we've been given that at the start of the question, to predict a theoretical mass in grams for each of the options and see how this matches up with the mass value in grams recorded in the lab. The mark scheme wanted you to link what you would find to prove that equation two is the correct answer. Here you can see that I've quoted the molar mass of the europium-2 hydroxide as 186 grams per mole and said that the mass I would expect this to achieve and be recorded in the lab as 1.86 grams would prove my answer to be equation 2. Moving on to question three, and eventually here, we're going to be looking at some organic chemistry for a change, but we start off with the preparation of a standard solution. That's what's happening here in part A. Now, here, this one was only five marks, and I've actually seen this come up as a level of response question a few times. And I've done a separate video on this, which gives you all the points you need to be aware of that have come up in previous mark schemes, including the finer detail that I've included in pink just here at the end that I would have included in my answer even though they weren't shown in the mark scheme and that's because you're preparing a rounded answer based on experience. 
If you'd like to look through how each of these stages help you prepare a standard solution and then use a video description to give you a full line by line explanation of the process involved, I'll put a link at the top of the screen now that you can use and I'll also make sure that that's in the video description as well. But this is just preparing a standard solution. So we've got our solid being dissolved in a small amount of deionized water, the use of a volumetric flask, rinsing and transferring the washings, stopper and invert it. But if you want to go over these finer detail points, follow the link at the top of the screen now or in the video description at the end of this tutorial. Next up in part B. The solution of barium hydroxide that has just been prepared is reacted with a multifunctional group organic compounds, carboxylic acid group only. In order to determine its structure, and of course, make sure it matches the general formula stated by the first part of the question, we need to work out its molar mass. Once we have this stage of our calculation finished, it's time to start drawing. So here what I've got are my moles of barium hydroxide. My question tells me that I've got this one to two ratio with compound D. So then I know my number of moles of compound D in 25 centimeters cubed. I then scale this up to how many moles of compound D were in the 100 centimeter cubed solution. And therefore my molar mass of compound D can be calculated as 114 grams per mole. We're told that the general formula of compound D shown here is CnH2n minus 1 COOH. And in order to make a structure that matches the 114, we have to have C5H9 COOH. Then we need to draw two possible cis stereoisomers of acid D. Make sure you know the difference between E, Z, cis, and trans. That is absolutely crucial going into your chemistry exam using your module for alkene chemistry correctly. And actually, you've got loads of options here. In the, if you look at the mark scheme, there's lots of different possibilities you could have for this one. And I want to emphasize that sometimes people talk outside the exam hall saying like, oh, what did you draw for this, that, and the other? There are so many different answers you could give here. You might find that you talk to three other people that do the exam and they all gave slightly different options. Now, yeah, sure, some of them might be incorrect, but don't get downhearted because you might have given both of these, like I've given here, or you might have given some slightly different structures and you may still all have been totally right. Check the mark scheme out and make sure you're secure with that theory of the difference between E, Z, cis, and trans. Okay, here we are with question four, and this is an excellent question for revising those rate of reaction topics, looking at module three, looking at module five. So this would be great prep for paper one. I also think it's a terrific question for looking at gradients, half-lives, level of response. It's just a brilliant question. It gets quite difficult towards the end, but the first two parts of this are absolute general revision fodder, and you should definitely be using this. It's all about pentwonine and iodine reacting, and there is some continuous monitoring of the iodine concentration. We get this great graph, which is very useful for revision, and it's concentration time, and again, it's looking at the iodine. Part A, quite an old school style of question for OCR. It asks why the order with respect to the pentwonine can be assumed to be zero in this investigation. And the answer is because the question describes the use of a large pentwonine concentration, which means we can consider its order to be zero. And this is because the concentration is kept high enough to be virtually constant. Next up, we've got a level of response question in part B. And there's three things we need to do. We need to prove that the iodine is first order. We need to calculate the initial rate of reaction. I'm actually going to do that first. And we need to find the rate constant for the reaction. Going back to the graph, let's have a look at two out of these three things. Kicking off with the initial rate of reaction. And I'm representing that here with this blue line. And then I'm going to go through my calculation back in the answer space in just a moment. The blue line, if I just move it out of the way for a moment, is a tangent drawn to t equals zero. So it's the initial steepness of the curve. And so if I just put it back where it was, you can see here what I've matched with this line is the initial steepness right up here at the start. 
there was a certain boundary that you needed to fall into for this. And that's to be expected because you've got the curve already drawn and you've got the points already plotted. I mean, it's fairly normal for them to ask for this. The other thing you can see on here is in red, I've got my half-lives being calculated. Now, in order to prove that something is first order, I need its concentration time graph and I need to calculate two different half-life values and show that they are constant. And that's my proof to it being first order. So what I've got here is I've got half-life one that I'm calling is for the time taken to go from 0.02 to 0.01. And my second half-life, half-life two, is for 0.01 to 0.005. And all I do, if I show you the 0.1 to 0.005, so my half-life two, because I think that's the clearest to show, I go from my first concentration out to the curve, I then go from my second concentration and out to the curve, and then I look at the time taken between those two different points where I meet the curve. And so my value here is 2,500 seconds, and that matches up with my first half-life as well, and that proves that the iodine is order one. There we go. Then I need to find the rate constant k, and I shouldn't be excited about it, but I am excited about it because you get to use a calculation that doesn't come up very often in the A-level. Yes, there's another way to do this, and yes, it's included in the math scheme. Of course it is, but I want to talk about this method, which uses those constant half-life values. So first off here, here's my working out for my initial rate of reaction. I've got my tangent, which is shown on the graph. Do make sure you show working out on the graph. It is part of the math scheme for these. And then I've got my gradient. I got 5 times 10 to the power of negative 6, which is inside their threshold of 4.5 to 6.5 times 10 to the power of negative 6. So we've not got a great deal to worry about there. Always quote your rate of reaction as a positive value, even if you get a negative gradient. Next off, my order of the iodine, proving that it's order 1. I've got my two different half-life values. I'm showing the concentrations to and from, and I'm quoting the values. And even if these values weren't absolutely identical, if they were very, very close together, I would still consider them constant. The math scheme does give a little bit of guidance on this. Next up here, I need to calculate the rate constant K. And I'm using a calculation that you don't get a chance to use very often in the A-level, but I'm going to use this as an opportunity to remind you that it is in your specification. If you have got a first order reaction, which I have got here, because that pent one -ene is being considered order zero, and the iodine here has been proved to be first order, that's the whole point of this section of the question, I'm going to calculate the rate constant K by doing natural log of two, so ln of two, or ln of two, however you choose to say it, divided by that constant half-life value. And so here what I've got is ln of two divided by, this value member was the 2,500 and that gives me a K value of 2.77 times 10 to the power of negative four. And again, there was a range for this, but it was consequential based on your other work in the question as well. Next off here in part C, I found this prediction of a two-step mechanism to be a little trickier than some of their older ones, as the overall reaction equation has actually only got one product. So you have to use your head a bit more here and think of a set of intermediate products that you could make in step one that become your reactants that you immediately get rid of in step two. The reactants in my slow step, aka my rate determining step, for a straightaway guaranteed mark in all of this must be the pent one and the iodine, as we are told that there is evidence in this section of the question that they are both order one in the rate equation. If, for example, the iodine was speculated to now be order two, then I would make sure to use two moles of it in the balancing on the reactant side. But I'm just giving you a hypothetical there. The rate determining step reactants must only be the species from the rate equation, and they must only be in those proportions. So, for example, one mole of each, as we can see here, because we're told they're both order one. Now, combining the two steps that I've got here for my suggestion of the two-step mechanism does actually cancel down to give the overall reaction equation, which is my other goal with this kind of predicting scenario. To finish part C, we have a bit of a, a regular conclusion to this. Um, we have a question thinking about adjusting the concentration of pent one to determine its order. 
And I don't think this is too tough. Just think about how you might have uh, worded this to see the two points here about keeping the iodine constant and only adjusting the pent one in at this time. Question five here starts off pretty normal. I think we've got maybe a little bit of a tricky oxidation half equation to conclude here. But as long as you don't overthink it and try and break up this N3 minus ion, I think you'll be all right. Here we're being told that sodium azide is being used in car airbags and the airbag inflates when the NaN3 decomposes to form nitrogen gas. There's the reaction equation that we'll come back to shortly in part two of section A. We're told it's a redox reaction and we need to write half equations for the reduction and oxidation processes that take place. Again, there's not a lot going on in the reaction equation, so I don't think it's too bad here to suggest the two starting ions and then balance this using the product shown in the equation. I think that's quite generous in the unified paper for two marks. Next up, we've got some ideal gas equation work. And again, I don't think this is too bad as long as you're able to spot that all the clues are here. You need to see how there's a volume, a temperature and a pressure here. So that's your big clue for the ideal gas equation. Just keep an eye on your units. Pressure is pascals, volume is meters cubed, and temperature is Kelvin. I've got all my working out and my ratio shown here. So once I've got my number of moles of the nitrogen, I ratio across to the sodium uh, azide. I believe it's called sodium azide. It absolutely is. Which is a 3 to 2 ratio here. So I divide by 3 and times by 2, break it down into stages, and then I find that mass value of the sodium azide by multiplying by the molar mass, getting me to 34.5. And again, just check whenever you give an answer in a chemistry exam that you've put the numbers through on your calculator correctly. And if there's any precision requirement, like here, giving your answer to three significant figures. Moving on with part B of question five, and I'll have a little confession to make in a moment, but this question actually has a pretty regular calculation to kick off with, which is for the pH of a weak acid. Well, the weak acid is hydrozoic acid. Now, hydrozoic acid is HN3, and it looks just like NH3 for ammonia, doesn't it? And I think there's a little bit of a, a maybe a tactic in there that you might give the wrong formula somewhere else on the page. I don't know. Uh, I have a little confession to make that actually I did write the wrong formula in here. This is why the HN3 looks really janky in there, but I caught it before I was going through the question. Here what I need to do, because it's just a weak acid calculation, I've got Ka equals H plus multiplied by A minus divided by HA. I'm going to simplify the numerator here by giving it that squared feature. That's using my approximations for weak acids in calculations. There are two of those. They're in your specification. Make sure you know them. It's come up on questions before. I then rearrange to make H plus the subject. So that's the square root of the weak acid concentration multiplied by the Ka. And then I do negative log of that hydrogen ion concentration answer to give me 2.75. If you'd like to practice all the different types of pH calculation, there's a link at the top of the screen now. And it's got a resource packed with questions in that you can use to uh, see where you're up to with your different types of calculation. Everything from strong bases to buffers in there. So have a look at that. Next up here, we are allocating some conjugate acid base pairs for the reaction of the HN3 with water. And we're assuming here our products, of course, because the HN3 is our acid, are going to be N3 minus the deprotonated HN3. And we've got our H3O plus, which is the protonated H2O. Don't forget that conjugate acid base pairs are two species that interchange between each other by the loss or gain of a proton. So when we select a pair, we need to make sure we choose one species from either side, and the only difference between them in terms of their chemical formula should be an H plus ion. That makes, for example, the HN3 and the N3 minus here a pair, and the acid out of the pair is going to be the one with that extra H plus ion, making that the HN3. So you can see here, I've labeled those as A1 and B1. The H2O and the H3O plus are the other pair, with the H3O plus being the acid, and the H2O being the base. Next up here, we've got some application with the Schmidt reaction. Never heard of this before in your A-level. They describe the use of a functional group change in this, so they give a bit of a description up here. But I would write this out, and I would also show any molecules that they name but don't draw, because it allows you to visualize this when you're putting the answer together. 
They also give two gases that are found in the atmosphere as in the products of this. I'd start having to think about what gases are quite common in the atmosphere so you don't go completely off, off the wall with this and suggest something random. I don't think putting this together is too bad. I think the trick to this one lies in having a look at what the functional group change is with a bit of a diagram, drawing out the 2-methylbutanoic acid before you have a go at this down here. I don't think this one is too bad, as long as you're good with drawing out those structures and supporting the question with some diagrams. Part C, to finish the paper, is quite a bit abstract, but it does follow a recent format of OCR exam questions where they ask you to determine the identity of a range of substances labelled with letters. We see this quite a bit in transition elements questions, but also very often in organic chemistry work. The question is split over two reactions, and we're going to treat them completely as separate. There's no real crossover between them, other than the fact ammonia is being used. Let's focus on reaction one first. In this, we're told that the copper two oxide reacts with excess ammonia to produce E, F, and G. And we've got some data in here for each of these, and we've got some data for the copper two oxide at the start as well. So our journey here is to use a logical method, which could vary a little bit from person to person as a way of determining what each of the structures are. And you get the most marks in this particular exam question for getting as many of these letters determined as formula as correctly as you can, and then for showing a decent process for how you got to each one of them. So let's have that working out shown. Let's make sure it's really obvious what you think each letter is. Let's have a look through what the right answer was. Now, first off here, it's instinctive in a way, but I've got the number of moles here of copper two oxide calculated, but I'm not going to use that for a little while. I'll explain what I'm going to do with it later, but I'm just going to have that here for now because I'm going to come back to its use shortly. I'm actually going to start my analysis here looking at G because when I rewrote the reaction equation, labeling it up with all the different data I have for the letters, I always find this incredibly useful for these questions. I found that I had the most data for G. I've got a mass for it, and at room temperature and pressure, I've got a volume. Now, the room temperature and pressure volume allows me, with the use of the molar gas volume, to determine a number of moles of G. Now, since I've also got a mass, I can actually find the molar mass, or we can call that the MR value of G, which is 28.0 grams per mole. Now, since I'm actually told that the copper two oxide is reacting with ammonia, it's not a massive leap to then make the conclusion that G, being a gas, must be nitrogen. So I'm making the conclusion here that G is nitrogen and I'm already one down. Next off for E. E, if you look at all the products, is the only solid product. Now, considering we've got some copper over here on the reactant side, it's pretty fair to assume that E is going to be the destination of the copper on the product side of things. So I'm going to assume here that there's a one-to-one -one ratio, at least, between the copper oxide and whatever E is. Now, as I mentioned before, I do actually have the mole value for the copper 2 oxide, and that's 0.06. So here I'm going to assume that E is 0.06 as well. And I'm going to do molar mass equals mass divided by moles for the E and see what I get. And actually, I get the value for copper. So again, I've got my next one ticked off. E is solid copper metal. Now, what that leaves me with, it's not the most exotic of methods, but all the other elements I've not used yet do make a very familiar liquid, don't they? So I've got oxygen, hydrogens in here. I know it's a liquid, and unfortunately, the question didn't give me any more data. F is going to be water, but I still explain that conclusion. So what about the balanced reaction equation? Well, you could get to this by just writing out the individual components and having to go at balancing, but you might find you are perhaps a little bit quicker here if you actually considered the mole values of the copper oxide, of the copper, and of the nitrogen that you were able to get from the data in the question. Moving on to reaction two, and if you're good at organic chemistry, I definitely think reaction two is easier to solve than reaction one. Again, I've done a little sketch here of what's happening in the description of the question with labels of data, and I really do think this makes a massive difference to how you can answer these questions. 
We are told that H reacts with ammonia to produce an organic compound called I, and there's loads of data for that structure, and a chloride salt labelled J. Now, I is actually pretty straightforward to analyse. It has a clear molecular formula given by the question, so I've got that up here, C2H5NO. I'm going to come back to that quite a bit in a moment. And we've also got an infrared spectrum. Now, in the infrared spectrum, it's very clear to see that I've got an NH peak and a C double bond O. First off, I'm going to draw a line from 1,500 upwards, like so. And I'm going to ignore the fingerprint region over here. Because unless I have some further information, I'm not usually digging around in this region. So the peaks I'm looking at are this one, maybe this one, but I'll explain why only maybe. And this one just here. Now, I've got one oxygen and one nitrogen in the formula. So I need to bear that in mind when I'm analysing the spectrum. What I've got here is very clearly a C double bond O. I mean, we see that in aldehydes, ketones, carboxylic acids. We see it in a range of different structures. That's definitely the C double bond O. And that gets rid of the oxygen feature in the formula. So when I get to this peak over here, I'm not suggesting OH. I'm suggesting NH because I've already got rid of my only oxygen in the formula. So it's not an OH and a C double bond O because I've only got one oxygen. This peak here would actually be for CH, but you never really get any credit for that in the mark schemes because that's present in so many structures. So here you can see I've analyzed my infrared spectrum peaks using the data values from the actual spectrum. I've got my NH and my C double bond O. If unsure, quote the values from your data sheet. Then the data suggests that H is an acyl chloride, I is an amide based on those functional groups, and J is therefore the ammonium chloride salt. Now, there's quite a lot to unpick here. Let's just rewind a little bit. We know that H over here on the left-hand side, if we go back to my description, has got to be containing some chlorine. Now, the reason that I know it contains some chlorine is because I have all the formula information here in the spectra data for I, and there's not a whiff of chlorine in that, whereas over here, J is a chloride salt. Since there isn't any chlorine in ammonia, that means H must have had some chlorine in to begin with. Now, when you start to piece all of this together, if you've really revised your organic pathways very well, you should start to think here, I've got some chlorine in here, and it's an organic, I've got NH and C double bond O in I, that sounds a bit familiar, and J is a chloride salt. This is ammonia reacting with an acyl chloride to produce a primary amide and an ammonium chloride salt. This is absolutely module six, and you can see I've got the reaction equation here. I really don't think this is too bad but you could be drawn into the idea that it's a unified chemistry exam question. It's got to be something completely random and off the specification, and that just isn't the case. If we follow the data here, and even if you weren't able to make this 100% conclusion, follow your data, say what you see, and I actually think you would be able to meet this conclusion. I hope you found going through this exam paper really helpful. If you did and you've used this video for revision, I would really appreciate it if you could leave this video a like before you go and consider subscribing to stay updated ahead of your A-level exams. There's loads of links on screen now to my other content and there's far more in the video description. Thank you once again very much for watching and until next time, happy revising.